Hey, good morning everyone. It's Tractor Man 44 here. I'm back in my father-in-law's basement. Uh, here it is, the 21st of April, and we got a little bit of a cold snap. Had a couple inches of snow last night. Of course, it's about already gone this morning. It's supposed to be a high of 55, but right now it's 27 degrees outside. He called me a little bit earlier this morning and said that the um, doggone furnace didn't come on. Uh, it's 55 degrees in the house, and of course it's pretty chilly in here. Anytime you have a 92% uh, efficiency rated furnace, 92% or higher, there's added controls and components and things like that in there that are susceptible to, uh, uh, to failure. And they require just a certain bit of maintenance. You can't foresee virtually everything at all, by no means. Now this thing here has been a good furnace. We had to put a gas valve on it a couple, three winters ago. Last year it had a faulty pressure switch, and so that was locking out, keeping it from going. This morning we've got Mother Nature that took care of the issue. Oxidation is just a funny thing. Oxidation is Mother Earth's way of reclaiming what she thinks is hers. So if you have a, a piece of metal or combination of metals that are in an environment that uh, might have a little degree of dampness, that's the perfect recipe for Mother Nature to create oxidation because she wants to rust it all down or rot it all down and reclaim it, take it back into what it was originally. That's why you get barnacles on, on all kinds of things, you know what I mean? It just, it just begins rusting away or rotting away. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the, the switch that's all oxidized up. It's actually a manual reset safety switch, but it's in the control circuit. It's one of the several that's in the control circuit that if there's a, uh, um, for whatever reason, the switch stops flowing electrons, whether it's oxidation buildup on the terminals that makes it unable for the electrons to flow through that connection, or the switch itself opened up because of a safety concern, it's going to stop the furnace. So let's take a look at our show. Take a look inside our furnace vestibule. Of course, here's the combustion air fan right here. Here's a pressure switch that went bad last year. Here's the gas valve that went bad a couple of years ago. Here's our gas line. And like I said, this is a 92% AFUE uh, rated furnace. And then here's the drain line that runs dr uh, condensate that may develop in the flue pipe. And to keep it from flowing back down into the heat exchanger, the secondary heat exchanger, it'll go ahead and trap it and take it on down the drain. But if you look behind that right here, you'll see this switch, which is a manual reset high temperature limit switch that's actually in the discharge of the combustion air, which is what's responsible for in case there's a flue blockage and the pressure switch decides it's not going to take it out because of increased pressure because of the blockage. What will happen is the temperature will increase to a point to where it'll open that limit switch. So that's a redundancy in the control circuit. If the pressure switch doesn't open because of blockage, then the intense temperature is going to open. And this requires a manual reset. But, like I said, if you can see that oxidation in there, if you look closely, you can see Now normally when you see something like that in an electrical circuit, you would think that would be electrolysis. That's not the case. This, is, this here actually happened because of moisture dripping down on it. So I've got to pull that switch off, I've got to shine up the contacts, clean all this oxidation off. Looking a little better than it was when we started. You want to get as much, elect much of those barnacles and stuff of that oxidation off as possible. And it's important that you actually scratch the inside of these terminals by whatever means necessary. I have a little file that I usually run in there, but I got the sandpaper ripped down real tiny. And this time I'm going to just go ahead and move that sandpaper with a tiny screwdriver back and forth to clean those internal surface of that. Because those uh, transfer electrons or conduct electricity just by merely gripping onto the spades and transfer from the, you know, in the control circuit through that physical connection. So if you loosen those spades too awfully much, you're going to create a condition also that restricts the flow of electrons and gives you a problem itself. So this having been cleaned, I've already cleaned the surface of it in here. I'm going to go ahead and put that back together and then we'll start it up and see if we have normal operation. Of course, any time you work on this, even though this is only low voltage, you want to make sure your power is turned off. Now let's put it back together, see what happens to our indicator lights, and see uh, if it's going to want to go. It's going to have a pre-purge cycle. You'll hear the combustion air fan start up, 
and it's going to run for a predetermined period of time set up by the algorithm in the board to make to make sure that it expels any unburnt gases out of the primary and secondary heat exchanger and up the flue so that prior to it establishing ignition there won't be a buildup of gas in there so it's going through a pre-purge and that pre-purge on this one is probably going to be roughly 30 seconds once you go through a pre-purge you should hear some relays click on the circuit board and you should hear the uh, uh, the gas valve open up and we should be able to see an orange glow up here or on the top can you see that orange glow reflected on my hand that's indicating that the uh, glow coil is actually energized so there you can see the glow coil off to the side right there right over there at the end of my finger so in just a few seconds it's going to uh, go ahead and open the gas valve I said it was going to open it but it's not there you heard that click there's the gas valve there's main burner direct ignition to all the burners it's got a very nice blue flame in there of course with the combustion air blower on a 92% furnace all that stuff is pretty much fixed uh, there's no real air adjustments like the old atmospheric burners where you had to adjust the, the incoming air at the burner venturi to make sure that you had a perfect blue flame with just a little flake of a yellow tip on top ever so often. But our indicator lights over here are indicating a normal operation. There's our normal operation calling for heat. Now this all looks complicated and everything, but there's really not that much to it. These circuit boards pretty much take care of everything in, in the system. This is a series of relays to turn the blowers on and off, combustion air blower, indoor blower, uh, the whole bit. And those, there's pressure switches here that provide inputs to the circuit board to tell the circuit board algorithm what's happening in the circuit. Like if you have an open safety switch, you cannot merely just jump the safety switch like you could in the old days to get temporary heat. Whenever the algorithm in the circuit board realizes that whenever a switch is closed, when it's not supposed to be closed at a particular point of initiating the circuit for heat, it will not allow that initiation to begin because it knows something has been bypassed. So they've thought of all that kind of stuff. And there's any number of things like that. Here's a flame rollout sensor up here in the furnace, underneath the furnace burner area. There's an upper limit, high limit, temperature limit in the vestibule, which is uh, on the heat exchanger. This is a, a limit switch that's on the uh, combustion air fan discharge. And there's another high limit switch, which is actually mounted back in the back on the blower assembly. Now, all of those provide inputs to this. Those are just some of the things that provide inputs to the circuit. All the limit switches, anything to do with the gas train, are going to be hooked in series. And then the pressure switches themselves and then the temperature indicators are going to provide input to the circuit board uh, separately. On a side note, there's high temperature limit switches in here because these furnaces require a, a minimum rise in temperature across the heat exchanger to make sure they're not overheating. Sometimes if you have a a circuit that continues to open on high limit you need to check your filters that was not the case in this particular one we proved that but if you take a look here's a filter right here I'll go ahead and hold up the light even though you can see through it it is definitely dirty because this is an extended surface pleated filter and it has a much greater efficiency over the, the old blue throwaway see-through filters so what happens is whenever the surface area of the filter increases in the in dirt accumulation or dust accumulation, it creates that pressure drop across that filter. When you have that pressure drop, that limits the amount of flow that's going across that filter and it allows the temperature rise inside the furnace heat exchanger to elevate above the rated uh, elevation and it will continue to cycle on a limit switch. So you always keep it a steady supply of, of filters around and they are directional. If you take a look and you see that you have wires on the back side of your filter, that side goes towards the furnace because that's the stronger side and as this builds up with a accumulation of dust and dirt it needs that strength to hold it in place believe it or not because I've actually changed filters that had a quarter of an inch of, uh, of a carpet of dust, dirt, dog hair, filth and stuff on the surface of it and what happens is eventually they just get drawn right into the floor department. But make, a furnace, make the furnace drops in a standard size, but then again, I allow or a longer filter than necessary so that you can easily get a hold of it, grasp it, and pull it out. Well, you still have air leakage around them, so a lot of times, I'll go ahead and make a cap just like this right here. And you see, it's a nice cap. And that'll rest right over the top of it, and it's got a couple of screws that hold it in place. Now, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll make that cap, and I'll make little rails down the side to where those rails are right will allow the side flanges to just slide right down and be hooked into those flanges. But this particular one, for whatever reason, I just made that 
something like that, and I've got a couple of screws, so I have to put those screws in. Another thing, too, if you're doing routine service on yourself and you have to take your doors off, on pretty much all gas-fired appliances that are newer than, than 15 or 20 years, have a door safety switch built into them, integral to the, the high voltage circuit. So whenever you remove this bottom door, if the system is online and running, everything shuts down because, hey, you know, manufacturer don't want you to get your fingers in the blower assembly or they don't want you to get shocked or anything like that. So there's a safety switch right here, and it varies on location with the, with the different manufacturers. But when you open that, it opens up that circuit. And a lot of times, I've been on a number of service calls where people have serviced their own equipment, put everything back, didn't get the, the door fitted in correctly, and the safety switch was not closed. So you take off the top door, reach in, put a little pressure on it like here, and boom, everything will start right up. So then you check and see that they didn't have the door in, installed properly. So that's just something for you to, to keep in mind if you decide to get into and work on yourself. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. Uh, you probably shouldn't, especially with the equipment and stuff like it is today. And you probably have to have, should have to call a qualified service tech or some old retired guy in the neighborhood kind of like me. But don't call me, please. And if you look on this circuit board, now, all manufacturers are going to vary. They're not going to be the same. However, there are generic boards for replacement that, that are uh, generically adaptable to look at different manufacturers. But uh, yours will have something similar to this guy right here. You know how your floor stays on a little bit after your, uh, your, heat, your heat goes off? The floor stays on, and that's called floor delay. And you can see on this particular one here, there's a set of... They're not dip switches, but they're jumper pins right here. Now those jumper pins have, uh, I think, five different combinations that you can attach to. And you'll have to read in the manual, but you can adjust the amount of time that you want that blower to run to blow the residual heat out of the heat chamber by changing those pins from 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 180 seconds, whatever. And also you can see right next to that, of course, there's a very poor video. This is not Hollywood production. You can see the words cool and heat, and you can see high, medium, high, medium, low, and low on two toggle switches or positional switches right there. That's where you select what speed you want your blower motor to run in the heat mode and in the cool mode. Take a minute to talk about this old system. Uh, we put a whole new ductwork system in back, I can't remember how many years ago, along with this furnace. The old system was just, just nasty. It had been there for years and years and years. But if you notice the rounded fittings on the return air key and on the supply air key, even the inside radiuses are rounded. And if you take a look down here towards the bottom, you can see how I made that reduction in the uh, return air, transcended it from the large dimension all the way down into the return air filter rack 90. And I showed you the, uh, the filter cover there before. But I, I always did that years and years ago because I had a lot more time and uh, I guess a lot more ambition. I kind of slacked off doing that lately. I don't, uh, I still make transitions and offsets and things like that, but I don't go to the trouble of running them through the easy edge on the Pittsburgh machine and making those rounded fittings. I square them off or rectangle them off. Now, like I said, I, I'm not telling you all to, to try service service in your own furnace. Uh, if you're a tradesman, you know, if you're an electrician, something like that, or if you're even a, a sheet metal guy, you know, somebody that's been around equipment and things like that, and understand the things that trouble, uh, that service techs, you know, troubleshoot and talk about, um, it's probably okay, but still I wouldn't recommend it. You probably need to have somebody that has a little bit of experience and at least a little bit of knowledge, um, you know, come and take a look at it. Like I said again, especially on these newer style furnaces. And I say newer, this one's still 10 or 12 years old. I can't remember when I installed it, but it's been a while back. And the newer one's even more particular than this. This one here is definitely, uh, definitely put to rest. And so, um, if you all enjoyed that, I'm going to go upstairs and talk to the father-in-law. And this is Practiman 44. And I'm out of here, guys. <laughs>